Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. This is a talk about a cloud native refactor of one of the. Hi, Apache. Martin. How are you? Oh, Long sorry. time no see. Sorry, one moment. Oh, hi, Anu. How are you? I'm, I'm fantastically ah, well. Fine. Well, I haven't seen you in the last five years. What are you doing nowadays? Oh, it's been a while since I met you too. Uh, these days I work on something called Apache Ozone which is an object store based on the Hadoop storage layer and it is, uh, supports S3 protocol as a primary communication mechanism. It sounds so. very good. Is it uh, something like the Hadoop, HDFS? You already have some storage, right? Yeah, we do. Uh, uh, it is the uh, next generation of HDFS which is primarily being rebuilt for, you know, scale, consistency and things like that. Yeah, that sounds, ver sounds very good, yeah, because, and I'm just, I, I'm just trying to find a good object store. You know that it's, maybe you have one or? Really, yeah, of course, you know. Anything that I write is really good. So of course, our, if you're looking for a good object store, this is the place to come. But you know, I'm just curious, what are you looking in an object store? What do you, what is your use cases? Well, uh, okay, first of all, I think you got it. So we are just playing roles. So this is the disclaimer. So, but the, Main reason what we are doing this, because I think this is the most effective way to tell you our story. Yeah, so uh, in the last couple of years, we've been working on taking the most successful uh, distributed file system and make it work on Kubernetes and in container and in cloud native way. So we are going to take you through the journey of how you take a real application like uh, HDFS and port it over and make it work on something like Kubernetes. Yeah, and one, one reason why I think it's very important to talk about this one, because I don't know if you, if you know the feeling when you find a new technology and according to the, uh, according to the getting started guy, everything works well because the hello works can be deployed with the new tool, but a real application, it's a totally different story. So. I think the Hadoop itself, or the new version, the Hadoop Ozon, it's a very good real distributed application because if we can do it, we can use it in a cloud native environment, then I'm pretty sure that any other stateful distributed application also can be used. So in fact, but we are both uh, Apache Hadoop committers and we are working on the Hadoop Ozon, but no. Oh, sorry, what was your question? Oh, um, I was just asking you why are you looking for a new uh, object store and what is a use case? Yeah, you know that uh, I'm working currently with machine learning uh, models and we just uh, decided that we should move everything to the Kubernetes. I'm pretty sure that I don't need to explain it why. But uh, Kubernetes says that bring your own storage. And yeah, I have no storage what I can bring, so I'm just looking for a good storage and maybe you can, you can uh, help me. Absolutely. Uh, we do have an excellent storage. We have the reputation for, you know, the, the most widely deployed distributed storage. And I hope that, you know, we can carry it over to, oh, what is this? Okay, oh, so... Cloud so, native world. Yeah, that's so just one question. And, and I can use your storage. Is it cloud native or, or not? I have, I have no idea. I've never, I mean, what does cloud native even mean? Okay, so I have a plan. I need a storage, and I'm pretty sure that your storage should be run in a cloud native uh, environment. So why don't we do something together? So you know all of the details about the Hadoop and distributed system. I can help with the cloud native environments, and let's check that what if will be If you say so, result. because I have absolutely no idea what cloud native is, so let's explore. Okay, so yeah, let's, maybe we can start with the cloud native. Okay. It's very easy to explain, right? Because the only thing what I need to explain is a Google. And this is from the CNCF charter. So the cloud native technologies empower organizations to build and run scalable applications in modern dynamic environments such as public, private, and hybrid clouds. Seriously? Do you have any questions? Seriously? Did some marketing guy write this? I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me. I, I, I think you cannot even repeat it without looking at it. Oh, so oh, oh. I'm really sorry. It makes Maybe no sense. Maybe I, I can get some help. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I know there are okay. a lot of you guys who actually understand this very well and, you know, 
Okay, yeah. I have another Le definition before uh, trying to repeat, okay. right? So this is from the cncf.io, and this mm. cloud-native computing uses an open-source software stack to deploy applications as microservices, packaging each part into its own container, and dynamically orchestrating those containers to optimize resource utilization. Like, well, at least well, we have words, right? <laughs> yes, yes, so I do understand open-source microservice and container, and you know, no pun intended, but it seems like a definition written for an engineer. My name is engineer, but you know, still. That's all. Oh, but still, there is this part where, uh, you know, this is too generic. I mean, I know these words, but what does it really mean to do a cloud-native application? Yeah. So maybe you should explain it like I'm five, maybe. Uh, actually, there are more than one approaches to explain. So the only thing what I can explain you is that what is cloud native for me? What is my, my personal uh, vision about, about cloud native? And, well, let's uh, hear that. OK, let's start with, you are a Hadoop developer, right? Yes, I So am. you have releases, you upload the releases, the sources are there. There are binary Tor files, which contains all of the required uh, jar files and components and everything. So how can I, uh, how can I run it in, in Kubernetes or Amazon Cloud? <laughs> Untar it and say run. That's how we do it. And that's how we do it everywhere. Oh, I, I know that you do it in this way, but I would like to start it. So any help, or is it my problem or your problem? Uh, generally, we believe it's your problem. That's our whole okay. policy. So I think that is the big difference. So as a developer, this is my responsibility to, to support it to run in any kind of cloud environment, or Kubernetes, or just locally, the Docker Compose. So I think this is a, a big difference in the, in the cloud native area, that this is not just a tool anymore, right? We need to support it to run it. And uh, uh, one way to support it is, uh, what, which one is very important for me, to create the connection. So this is a team game, right? It's not just one application and a tar file and do it your own self, but one way to support it and run in multiple environments to make the connection and make it easier to run together with the existing monitoring, logging application, or in existing clouds, So you're actually. basically saying we have to be part of the environment and be a good citizen to play in this cloud-native world. A good team player, actually. So that, this is a teamwork, right? That's a pretty right? good takeaway, yes. Okay, I, I have another approach as well. So I think this is very well known, and I can just you, uh, show any other uh, cloud, the, the UI of any other cloud providers. So this is the usual user experience for a, a, of a cloud provider, right? You can just click, click, and you can start a new machine, and everything is clear what's going on. And I think this is the user experience what we are looking for. And this, the before, this, so this picture to connect our, our project to all of the other systems, it's not just because we like to create connections, but we would like to provide similar user experience. Not a UI, it's not about the UI, but if we can provide the same usability or same observability, even with just command line tools, then I think that is, uh, could be very useful. So you're saying there's a large amount of consistency in the user experience where every software has some shared tenants which we can all share. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so for, for me, so again, this is just for me, but for me, the cloud native, the, the biggest uh, step in cloud native, that this is an improvement on the user experience. And the users are also the administrators and the oper operators. So I think that's what we, what we need. Yeah, I heard somebody say yesterday that, you know, in the new Kubernetes world, your tools will change, but it's for the better because, you know, you'll have more consistent tooling and usage across all your systems, whether you are using Apache Cassandra or Apache HDFS or some other tool like CockroachDB, you'll have a much more uniform experience. So it'll be good to play there. Yeah, and uh, right now, this is how Ozone looks like. Uh, you can run on Kubernetes with kubectl apply-f, Docker. If you want to bring up a pseudo cluster to play around with on your laptop, you run Compose up and, of course, we still believe in running it on bare metal with the no normal start functions. And I think this is a very good example for this connection, so that the traditional Hadoop can be used from all Spark, High, but only with the, the Hadoop interface. But the real storage should be used with multiple type of interface, right? The connections, and one connection is the AWS interface. So this is the common language, like the English, right? Every, everybody speaks AWS CLI interface. And, and this might come as a very great surprise to you guys that, you know, uh, Marthon always tells me that Twitter is a foundational influence to 
our uh, distributed systems because we want to make sure that any of these startup lines fit into a tweet. You know, it's one of the rare times we like, you know, acknowledge Twitter's influence on distributed files. Yeah, systems. I think a good getting started guide should be fit in one tweet. And not because we are hiding the complexity, but because it's, we can manage the complexity. Okay, so I think we, we, we managed uh, the deployment start. At least we can, we can start. But I have some concern that what will be happened after the starting. So the network could be one of the, one of the problem. Really? Network? I think it's a solved problem. What could go wrong? I, okay, let's try to understand first that what is, what is inside your project. So how can it work? Oh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, there is uh, an object store uh, metadata manager, which contains, uh, it's called the ozone manager. It manages all the namespace. So objects like buckets and keys are managed in the namespace layer. Then there is a storage manager, which is a block level manager. So there is a separation between the block manager and the namespace manager, and the actual blocks live on data nodes. It's a pretty standard architecture for any distributed storage system. Okay, I'm trying to repeat it. So, so you have some kind of slave nodes which uh, has the data and all of the others are just managing the yep. uh, data that and saving the metadata. Correct. Okay, yes. so it sounds good, but there, I have just one question. That how do, you, do you use DNS or is it a requirement for you? Yes, it is. Um, what about DNS? Oh, uh, nothing problem with the DNS. It's, it's the question that how do you use it, right? Uh, we just look up you know, name of an object, and yeah, you, you know, think that the DNS it. can be used just in one way, right? Just click to the button. Yeah, so the and we presume that the machines are already pre-configured for us. Okay, let me explain the problem. So okay. let's say I have a Kubernetes cluster. So you have multiple slaves, right? And yeah. you would like to scale it up and down. So this is in the right side. I have three instances, and by default, the instances have IP addresses, no DNS all, at all, because we separated the DNS from the instances. So uh, you have one DNS. This is something like the load balancer. And behind the load balancer, we could have multiple instances. That's very nice. Yeah, it sounds good, but it's a stateless application. The only stateless application can do that. Yeah, um, a distributed file system cannot. Yeah, actually, I don't think that it's, it's about stateless or stateful. What I think is that uh, you have a very specific uh, use case. Because in a normal use case, all of the services are equal. But in your case, you would like to get an information from the metadata server that where the data is stored. And you would like to directly use the data from the right data node because you have a very sophisticated application algorithm. That is true. Yeah. So that's not about the problem of DNS, but that how can you access? Because here we have a DNS, but the instances itself can be, can be used only by the IP address. But this is not about the DNS, so it's not about, I know that it's a very old protocol, so it, we use it. That <laughs> yeah, it, it shouldn't be about DNS because it has been working from 1980s. Okay, so. yeah, it's still, okay, it can be used with the Kubernetes, but uh, let me give you an other example. So you, you mentioned that you have two metadata server, right? That is true. Okay, and is there any dependency between them? Yes, we have a very strict startup sequence. We bring up the SCM, which acts as the cluster manager, and then all the other services join onto it, like the ozone manager or the data nodes join, and then they become a membership oh, oh, protocol oh, where we can okay. learn. I don't understand the names, but what I understood that uh, you have one service which should be started at the beginning, right? That is correct. And you have another service which would like to connect to the other service, right? That is also correct. Okay. The only problem is that I can't guarantee that they will be started in the, in this order. I can well, just I thought start the your whole services. deal was that Kubernetes was an orchestrator. In my mind, when you say orchestrator, I should be able to say just start this and then start that, just like an orchestrator. Yeah, and how can you orchestrate it in this way? I don't know. Do hundreds that? of containers. Just start this, uh, this, this, this. Yes, that's that. Okay. So we are starting everything together in the same time, okay. and this is your responsibility to be prepared if the DNS is not. Not yet available. Okay, so we just write retry loops everywhere because we have no consistent path to define. Yeah, that's a very good sequences. practice actually, and this is just a small modification. So it's not about yep. not a very big problem with the DNS, but you should be prepared that in case of a retry, you should 
invalidate your DNS uh, cache as well. Okay. That okay. makes sense. You okay. know, it would have been nice if Kubernetes actually had a way to say, hey, here is a uh, CRD, and I have these dependencies, and I would like to start it in a certain way. OK. Let's focus on what we have now, yeah. right? Okay. And so, another problem could be the reverse DNS, because as I remember, Hadoop uses uh, Kerberos, which depends on the DNS. So maybe we should check the security first, and, and let's talk about the security. Okay. That what kind of security do you have? Yeah, so you know, uh, we rely on Kerberos primarily because uh, we need, before we let somebody read a file, we need to know who you are. And Kerberos is the de facto protocol where we can recognize who you are. So you know there's a directory backing it, like Active Directory and stuff like that. So you can configure Ozone to work against it. And when you read or write, your access permissions are checked. So that's how it works. Yeah, actually, I would be very happy to say that, oh, Kerberos, it's so old school, and it's so, I don't know. It, it was used only at the previous century. But I couldn't say that we have anything better in the Kubernetes I side. have to disagree so strongly, because it is one of the few really working protocols out there. I don't think there is a replacement for Kerberos out there. I, I don't know what Kubernetes does, but maybe Kubernetes has well, invented something itself, but I don't think I, there is any user identity system which can replace Kubernetes. Okay. Actually, mean, Kerberos what we, today. actually, what we have is the role-based access control, but this is for the Kubernetes resources, so it's not for <laughs> you. It's just to, for in, in the, uh, the container orchestrator. And we have some kind of secret management, but okay. yeah, I need the real security or your project, so, but let me have a question. So as I remember, the biggest problem with the very good Kerberos, that for installation, it could be very painful, right? If I remember well, I should generate this key tab files, and I should copy there, and this Kubernetes is not this copy game, so. Completely agree. It used to be an extremely big pain point. If you had 3,000 data nodes, we expected you to put a key tab file which acts as your identity inside the system because you're a service. Nobody can type in your password and username, right? So you put that into a file and make sure nobody else can read that other than the service. So you had to do it 3,000 times before you could go ahead. But that has been addressed in the uh, Ozone world where we only use that only on two machines. Only the metadata servers need that. When Ozone boots up, it creates its own certificate infrastructure, goes MTLS, and uses a token-based management based on Kerberos. So all the identity is managed that way. So yes, we still have that pain point, but it's only two files. OK. So I'm not sure if I understood, but it means that I don't need to use the Kerberos key tops at all for the ser servers and None services. None of the slave nodes need Kerberos configuration okay, at all. OK, so just for the clients. And I can yes. use the, the certificates everywhere. That is true, just for okay, the clients and the meta, two metadata okay. servers. That's good. So still we can, we, we can make the deal. So, right. okay. so the security is uh, solved. Uh, in Kubernetes, another way to provide transparent uh, network uh, encryption is the service mesh. Do oh, you need one? I have no idea what service mesh is. Oh, I have Google, so I can just explain it very easy. So okay. this is from Raist.io. The term service mesh is used to describe the network of microservices that make up such applications and the interactions between them. OK, you lost me again. I'm really <laughs> sorry. Maybe I'm dumb. Oh, so? <laughs> explain like I'm five. Why do we have a very good idea to do that? OK. Let's say you have containers, right? You have different services in pods. So and let's say you we put a proxy and a reverse proxy to each of the pods. And the only thing what you, knew, what you should do is just use these proxies and reverse proxies for all of the network communication. That's all. So just proxies, reverse proxies on the service level. And I'm sure that your question is, about why is it good? Yeah, the main advantage of this one, because we can manage all of the reverse proxies and proxies from one centralized location. And you can provide additional function functionalities, uh, let's say blue-green blue deployment, or you can yeah, transparent uh, network encryption, or you can just define any kind of security rules. You, can, you, you may get uh, more detailed metrics. So it's fine, right? That sounds interesting, but you know. Uh, I am I'm also, con I also concerned about you know, the number of network hops in an architecture like that, because you know, 
a distributed file system pushes too much data. It is not, if you're a database, you still can do that, but because these data packets are small, but when you're streaming large amounts of data, I wonder if it'll hit me. But you know, that's just yeah. a small concern. Usually I have no problem with the hops if, if the hops are small enough, right? <laughs> so okay. my problem is that it's nothing is free. So the complexity itself can be a problem. So service mesh is very, very powerful. We can do almost anything, but to install wow. a service mesh, for example, Ristio, I think you should um, install about 50 custom resource definition and more than 100 Kubernetes resources. So yeah, it provides some kind of visibility, but on the other side, some kind of, so still just installing. I didn't configure anything here. So, yes, so one of the other things that we found when we looked at this was the fact that you know traditional systems are used to the fact that there is something called GSS API and uh, configuring Kerberos at a network layer is being removed. Like it's very easy. I'm used to C or Java or stuff like that. I can just go write this code and it works. With the gRPC, up till now, I'm hoping that Kubernetes moves so fast that one day Kubernetes says, okay, we are going to support Kerberos authentication or a GSS-like API on the gRPC layer. But when you bring in an established application with a lot of security considerations, missing out on Kerberos hits you really hard. In fact, uh, you know, that was some of the reasons why our protocol uses gRPC based on whenever we use tokens. But when you do that one part of authentication between users to the metadata server, we have to flip back into raw TCP. So you know, it's kind of a bummer, but that's what okay. we do. So you said traditional applications, but I have an other kind of classification. So I think there are two kind of applications, the infrastructure applications and business application. And I'm pretty sure that this uh, ozone storage, it's an infrastructure application. And it's slightly different uh, from the business application. So for example, in, in ozone, I'm pretty sure that all of, the, all of the services are same. We have the same library for network protocol. So for example, we don't, need to, we, we don't need to use an external proxy just to catch all of, the, all of the networks. Because one very big advantage of the service mesh that it can work with um, heterogeneous uh, environment, right? Even if one application is written in Go, the other one is Java, you can get, just catch all of the no, networks. I, I buy into all the advantages, but it's simply not easy to lift an existing application with a serious security consideration and just say, okay, let's go service mesh, let's go somewhere. You will probably have to make yeah. uh, hard decisions on yeah. how you I do think, this communication. I think we, we, we agree. So I think you need just a small subset of the, of the service mesh functionality and maybe it's not the best way to introduce some kind of complexity yep. just because the, the, the few required uh, uh, functionalities. Uh, yeah, but if we don't use the service mesh, you should answer what is the, still, still we should answer the observa observability question, because one of the main advantage of the service mesh was that we can, we can check what's going on. So what do you have here? Oh, so uh, what we have uh, is a bunch of, uh, you know, homegrown solutions over time, because we started working far, be, be, you know, much before uh, CNCF and other stuff came into being. So yeah. uh, maybe that's a place where we should look at what to do. Yeah, that's exactly. So this is what we already discussed, right? So the, the good thing to connect to connect all of the components and be a team member with our project, it's not just um, to make it more popular, but it could be easier to achieve a few goals. For example, we have very powerful tools for log, log collections or metrics collections. So let's quickly go through what you have and maybe we can just improve it a little yeah. bit. So what do you use for metrics? So Hadoop supports uh, custom matrices and we have you know, just a sync into which we write with no consideration where it goes to. So it is you know, very agnostic to what technology we use. Okay, I have no problem with the custom metrics, but 
I think this is Prometheus, it's pr pretty clear that it should be used because this is one of the most popular uh, member of the CNCF ecosystem. So the only thing what I would like to ask from you is provide all of the numbers on an HTTP server. It's very easy, right? Just Absolute. an HTTP page. I will define the, the format in a Prometheus friendly format, but it's a, a very easy format. That so. sounds like an excellent plan. I okay. think we should use Prometheus. And if you can do it, I can give you unlimited number of powerful visualization tool and you can show everything in the world. Oh, okay. All of the metrics in your world. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So let's go forward. So tracing. I think this is the pretty common question that what's going on? Why is it also, slow? Um, Apache Hadoop has a really sad story here. Uh, we used to have our own tracing uh, sub project called Hadoop Tracing, which was abandoned at some point and now deprecated. So uh, I, I don't think our tracing really works or oh, ever worked for that matter. More and more sad stories. It yeah, really, of yeah. course. I can unearth a lot of them, but you know, this is one of the very sad stories. How, how can we get a happy end with this approach? I, I, I just don't, don't understand. <laughs> okay, so for tracing. I think in the Kubernetes uh, or the CNCF uh, uh, area, we, we are on the other side. We have more than one solution, actually. And they will be merged sooner or later. And, but until that, I think any of them are very powerful and very easy to, to put to an existing distributed application. So I'd just start, suggest to start with any of them. So. That's an excellent idea. In fact, you know, we should just go into one of them. I'm, I'm not exactly sure which to pick, or maybe it's open telemetry now. So. Or, or you can just use a coin, right? That's okay. The, okay. So last question. Where are your log files? Uh, we just write it to log4j and pretty much uh, use no collectors. You can configure. The end users get to configure your collectors. And, you know, whatever yeah, you do is your problem. That's the best way what I can do. It's my wow, problem. This is the fact you <laughs> finally, much. finally, you can see. I was saying the same thing about the tarball, and you said it's not very good. Okay, <laughs> but in this case, there are many powerful. Less is better. <laughs> yeah, there are many powerful tools. So the only thing, so this is the win-win situation, right? We have many powerful tools. Just collect all of all of the all of your logs. So just log to the console, for example, or one file, and we can just um, forward it to a central, central place with FluentD, Loki, or anything. So OK, I think we solved the problem. And so this happens to be one of my most favorite uh, parts of the work that we did, primarily because having worked through a distributed file system and how we integrated to cloud native technologies and how, how different the user experience is. It's one of the few things which I think has positively influenced our file system. The fact that we are able to go look at other solutions and say, OK, everybody has their core speciality. We store files. We give it back to you when you need it. But these other systems specialize in other things. And you know this whole ecosystem, I mean, the ability to leverage that is the most important thing. I mean, you know, the strength in the numbers is what makes cloud native so wonderful to work in. So small modification and way yeah. more happier developers. Yes, yeah, so right? the cost of doing in most of this on the screen is so low that even if you have a really old legacy application, we would still recommend you to go and integrate all of that. OK. So I have, we have one more remaining task, that the developers are already happy. I would like to be happy as well. So CSI, what is that? Crime scene investigation? Oh, oh, OK, almost. Yeah, it also can <laughs> help to be happy. But uh, CSI, so you have something which can be started now in the cloud native uh, environments and yes. works very well. Yeah. But I need your storage. Do you yes. remember? You need so, my storage, and we have S3 interface. OK, so this interface is just for the storage. This is a container storage interface, vendor neutral interface for what you You should stop using Google and explain like five minutes. Yeah, I, I was pretty <laughs> sure that that will be your ne next question. So let's say you have a storage system. I, have, I am the container orchestrator. OK. And I will ask you to, I will actually to, OK, first start with the volume creation. So I will ask you to create a storage. I okay. need five gigs. Can you please create one? Sure. OK, that's a controller uh, interface of CSI. Okay. It should be run in one place. So it's something like the master. Yeah, we have a but, master, okay. so it should be possible to run it there. OK, so how can I use it from the, from the node or co containers? So I will have a second question, a second uh, request that can you please mount it somehow. I can, I can define the destination path that 
could you please mount the previous, uh, previously created storage to this directory? And all of the other tasks, it's on, on me. So That is quite possible. Just mount okay. it then we are fine. Again, yep. just a small modification, right? And we are fine. Uh, generally, I would say it is fine, but you know, CSI does have some issues. And I know if there is any CSI committers here, we struggled with flowing the identity through. And uh, I know that CSI generally is designed for a volume, and volumes don't have identities. But you often talk about you know file system interfaces like NFS or you know uh, object store. And in a file system interface, the user identity is extremely critical. So the very fact that we have to go in and say, oh, when you're doing CSI, we will run in an uh, administrator context. So but allowing you to do mount CSI, this means that it is very easy to, we have to basically punch a hole in an extremely complicated security system that we have already built. Okay. So you know, it's like, you know, it looks like CSI is very new, so you know, I'm not saying that it's a, it is a deal breaker for us. We will support it, but it has a little more to go before it can be used in an enterprise place, because if you build something with that, and if your user identity doesn't flow correctly, mostly somebody who's in your security group will come and say, what are you doing? You cannot do okay, this. So. I agree that there could be problems, and security is a very important area, but I, I don't think that the CSI is the big problem. So the CSI is a very specified interface, so I it think is, it's it very different. No, so, I'm just saying that there's a missing hole where the, it's very difficult to flow the identity through the CSI yeah, system. I think, so. Yes, but I think it's most important to implement the, the data pass because it's not defined, right? I, I, I <laughs> ask you to, to mount the, your storage. And I must say that CSI did an amazing job where he said, data is your problem, go read and write, gives us perfect freedom to do whatever we want. Okay. It's in the control plane that, you know. How can you solve the data problem for me? It Outside works, CSI. it just works. You just mount the volume and read and write and it just How works. do you mount my volume? Oh, we use a, a CSI fuse driver which mounts this and allows you to write, read and write, and we are also going to support NFS and native fuse adapters for more performance. So. Oh, I like performance, so yeah. it sounds good. Yep, that's where we are, so. Okay, so it seems that we moved to a common direction, right? So now I almost have the storage. Your storage can work in the, in the Kubernetes. And the original question was that, uh, what can we, what can we get from this uh, uh, work where we are working, yep. where we can work together? And uh, this Hadoop Abyss Geos, and so my original expectation was just, uh, oh, this is a 10 years old technology and it should be refactored from the beginning to make it easier to work. But it turned out that with just small modification, very smart modification, small modification, it's a, a very first class citizen of the Kubernetes. It uh, is. Yeah, so there is one uh, small thing that I want to add. Uh, it might look like it was very easy to take an existing application, lift it, because the stuff that we talk about is very simple. But we started our journey really early with Kubernetes, probably at 8.0, and we've been continuously testing. It takes a really long time to build a distributed file system and make it stable. Okay, so... So uh, at every point, when because we use so extensively the testing and everything was done in Kubernetes, at every point, our thought process was influenced by cloud native. Your journey, if you take an existing complicated application and just try to lift it, it may not look exactly the same. Because it took us two years to and continuously think and iterate through cloud native technologies. And then another caveat is that Kubernetes is a great and wonderful system, and we want to actually be there forever, but uh, it moves too fast. Okay, so you know, features are coming in, and if you take a dependency on a feature too early, like you know, I'm a file system. I would have been sitting in entry, and then you would get deprecated, and you would go into CSI. So be aware of that when you take strong dependencies okay. on things. So Kubernetes is fast for you. How fast do you, how fast uh, your, the Ozone manager, the Ozone development? <laughs> so we, I mean, so there is a difference in writing an enterprise class software, which gets deployed in a very massive scale and writing something which is, which is a business uh, line of application. 
and you know file systems are specifically slower much slower so you know uh, whether uh, we we would started working before stateful sets or daemon sets became popular and being used so you now by the time it comes in we would say okay let's start looking at this this is one of the reasons why we would not go too deep into service mesh because at that time it was not okay. mature enough Le let me let me be more specific when can i use it can oh, I the ozone. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we are uh, we are at version 0.40, still tagged as alpha, but we think that we'll have our uh, GA releases by uh, third quarter or end of this year for availability. It's an open source thing, so you, know, you guys are most welcome to try it out. You can install it in a single thing, and it basically is. Uh, um, I would call it a spiritual successor to Hadoop HDFS, and you know we store large amounts of data. Uh, we typically store petabytes of data in various customers. All the Fortune 500 is, at, or at one point is used our software. So uh, we are just bringing known, tried, tested into the Kubernetes world. I hope that you will guys will actually end up writing stateful applications on Kubernetes and rely on us to address your statefulness. Okay, thank you very much to be here, and that was our hopefully. Oh yes, hopefully it uh, it helped to to explain that how it worked, and feel free to contact with us or just try out Ozone. As a bonus track, we also have uh, something like between the ham and customized to deploy Apache Big Data projects or any kind of projects, and. If we have time, we are happy to answer any yep. question yep. or any questions at all. Go ahead. Let me just give you this. Let me just give you this so you can ask us that. My question is. Do you think it's uh, worth the hassle to implement all the abstractions instead of, of rewriting all the Hadoop jobs to be, how to say, cl cloud native? So uh, the question is that is it worth uh, uh, implementing the Hadoop abstractions or just rewrite your jobs? The answer is that uh, typically uh, Kubernetes or a runtime like an infrastructure is not enough because you might have very uh, complicated jobs like Apache Spark, or you might have a complete layer of business running Apache Hive. So unless you have a strong underlying layer which offers you these abstractions, your rewrite spans very large amount of data. And then you will have to reinvent all those abstractions again. So it doesn't matter where you go, because the foundational notions of computing remain the same. So either you can go rewrite them, or you can lift and move them into Kubernetes. So I personally think Kubernetes as a new operating system. So hey, if it used to work on Linux, it should just work on Kubernetes. So that is why, that is my personal take. But you know, depending upon if you, if you are writing something very simple, it, it's, a, it's a you know case by case. So yes, there is a possibility that rewriting might just work for you. Yep. Let me just walk down. We have two more minutes. Uh, so uh, you have HDFS and you have Yarn, right? Correct. And what, happened, what happens in this scenario? Yeah, that's a great question. He says there is HDFS and there is Yarn. What happens in this scenario? So the Yarn guys are actually, and I'm not speaking for them, but Yarn guys have actually written a very smart scheduler on top of Kubernetes. I think it's called uh, Unicorn. And uh, they, uh, Yarn is a very rich scheduling methodology, especially for jobs. And they are, I think, will have one of these talks in KubeCon where they will explain how Yarn leverages Kubernetes. So uh, both HDFS and Yarn is actually moving to embrace Kubernetes full time. Basically, our uh, thought process, as I said, is that Kubernetes is our new OS. So yes, pretty much everything that you're familiar with will show up. And I think all of the big data ecosystem is slowly moving towards this reality that you know, whatever you're used to, right? you have a distributed database. Okay? Uh, so you, know, you, you have to bring it. Whether CockroachDB is there, 
whether it is Hive, if you have a large Hive installation, maybe you have 12 terabytes of data in Hive. So moving it over to Cockroach TV may not be the right thing. So no, depends upon how use cases, yeah. So Jan will come in pretty soon. Okay, I think this is end of our time, but we will be here and yep, coffee can. break is coming. So just Thank come here and we can continue the discussion. Thank you very much, guys. And if you want to ask us any more questions, we'll be around. Thank you.